Kenny, thanks so much. The floor is all yours for your opening statement. I just want to start by saying uh, thank you, James, and everyone with Modern Day Debate for organizing this this debate con too. It's an honor to be here. Also, uh, Matt, thank you for engaging in this debate. I actually want to gift you a copy of my uh, newest book, Your Right to Self-Identify, My Right to Disagree. All right. Uh, It's a token of our friendship here. New, New friendship. All right, so I'm ready. Let me just grab a quick drink of water, Matt. Okay. Is Islam true? Uh, this is a wide range of, uh, there's a wide range of topics that we could discuss on this question, but we obviously can't get to them all. So what I'm going to do during this debate is I'm going to focus on signs revealed in the Quran um, and prophecies that, of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that have been proven historically as well as with modern technology. This is not a debate about uh, whether or not Islam promotes terrorism. It's not a debate about the character of Muhammad, peace be upon him, or any of his wives. It's not a debate about the thousands of hadith that exist. We're here to, de- to discuss the truthfulness of Islam as to what has been proven verifiable. And unlike Christianity, by example, that uh, encourages people to walk by faith and not by sight, Islam does the opposite. I- Islam encourages mankind to challenge its truthfulness through discovery and th- through the use of logic and reason when approaching faith. Quite simply, God consciousness can only be built on a firm foundation of knowledge. This is why the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said that seeking knowledge is an obligation upon every Muslim. So this brings upon my first point, Islam encouraging mankind to challenge it, to challenge its truthfulness in the Quran. In nearly 1,000 verses of the Quran, Allah repeatedly challenges mankind to ponder, think, and reflect on what has been revealed. Allah says in the Quran, by example, this is a blessed book which we have revealed to you, O Muhammad, that they might reflect upon its verses and that those of understanding might be reminded. In another verse, Allah says, this is the book of which there is no doubt. It's a guidance for those conscious of Allah who believe in the unseen, who establish prayer and who spend out of what we have provided for them and who believe in what was revealed to you, O Muhammad, and what was revealed before your time and of the hereafter are certain in faith. They are on true guidance from their Lord. It is they who will prosper. So while guiding mankind to truth, the Quran addresses believers, disbelievers, and hypocrites alike. And in contrast to the view of some religions, as I mentioned, that pressure their followers to rely on blind faith, the Quran expresses the importance of reasoning and seeking knowledge, very important, and frequently asks people to, to use their intellect. In nearly 70 verses, the, the words for the root takul, meaning to reason, have been utilized in the Quran. And the Quran addresses those who refuse to reason as well by making very, very sh- striking statements against them. By example, Allah says, as to those who disbelieve, it's the same to them whether you warn them or do not warn them, they will not believe. Allah set a seal over their hearts and over their hearing, over their eyes as a veil, woe to them for the penalty that they bring upon themselves. In another verse, Allah says, and we have certainly created for hell many of the jinn and mankind. They have hearts with which they do not understand. They have eyes with which they do not see. They have ears with which they do not hear. Uh, they, are, they are like livestock, rather they are more stray. It is they who are the heedless. So the Quran describes some people as being like livestock uh, and and, and being worse than animals because unfortunately there's some people, some atheists in particular, and I don't think that's going to be Matt here, but by example, they use arrogance and sarcasm and hatred and mockery when discussing the mere existence of a creator. Just the mere existence, just the mention of a creator puts some of these people uh, in a state of annoyance and they react unreasonably. And while animals lack the ability to use logic and reason because they rely on instinct, uh, there are some people who refuse to reason or when they claim to do so, they do so unfairly or with bias or without proper knowledge. And when it comes to Islam, they reject it for what it is and condemn it for what it is not. And that, the reason being is because they have no true knowledge about what Islam teaches. They think they do because of the media. And so Allah says in the Quran, it is he who sent down to you, O Muhammad, the book. In it are verses that are clear and precise. They are the foundation of the book. And there's others that are unspecific. And as for those in whose hearts is a deviation from the truth, they will seek out those that are unspecific, seeking discord and seeking an interpretation that is suitable to them. But no one knows its true interpretation except for Allah. But those firm in knowledge say we believe in it. All of it is from our Lord and none will grasp the message except for men of understanding. So simply, Islam is the way of life that was exemplified by every prophet and messenger, peace be upon them all, all of whom submitted their wills to our creator, culminating in the final revelation being revealed to the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, via the Quran, 
And the Quran has a universal message. It guides humanity to recognize and worship our Creator alone. And in the midst of a very pagan and polytheistic 7th century Arabia, the Prophet, peace be upon him, went from being loved and, and, and respected and known for his truthfulness before revelation came down to being hated and despised and attacked and mocked uh, after he began receiving revelation from Allah through the angel Gabriel. But despite the persecution against the Prophet, peace be upon him, and just a small number of early Muslims, the Prophet, peace be upon him, kept spreading the, mes the message of Islam confidently to the point that Islam spread very rapidly. This is going to bring upon my, my second point. Islam spread, it, spread very rapidly in a very short period of time, gaining thousands of followers. It expanded from, in an incredible rate from Mecca to Medina to Spain to China, Africa, and here we are in 2022, and it's the fastest growing religion in every country in the world today, which is my second point. The expansion of Islam is revealed in the Quran and in authentic hadith. Allah says in the Quran, they want to extinguish Allah's light with their mouths, but Allah will complete his light even though the disbelievers dislike it. And the next verse says, it is he who sent his messenger with guidance in the true religion to make it prevail over all other religions, even though the idolaters dislike it. So we see this to be true. According to the Pew Research Center in an article in TRT World published in December 2021, they state that Islam is not only the fastest growing religion in the world today in every country, but it's also projected to be the largest religion of all by the year 2075. They say, and I quote, indeed, Muslims will grow more than fast as more than twice as fast as the overall world population between 2015 and 2060. And in the second half of the century will likely surpass Christians as the world's re largest religious group, end of quote. So that's according to another article in 2017. Thereby proving the prophecy of the Quran true, uh, as well as, well, in, in seventh century Arabia, where it, it became the dominant religion, as well as in current and future times, we see it gonna be manifested. It's already being manifest now as we speak. This also coincides with my third point, the prophecy of Muhammad, peace be upon him, in which he stated that Islam will enter every household as a sign before the day of judgment. It's narrated in authentic hadith, narrated by Ahmad and his Musnad from Tamim al dari who said that he heard the prophet say, and I quote, this matter of Islam will certainly reach every place uh, touched by the night and day. Allah will le not leave a house or a residence, but Allah will cause his religion to enter it, by which the honorable will be honored and the disgraceful will be disgraced. Allah will honor the honorable with Islam and he will disgrace the disgraceful with disbelief. And so, in a very short 1400 years, we see this coming to pass. Uh, Islam as is an organized religion in a short 1400 years has grown exponentially, even in times when the Muslims have been at their weakest and despite all the negative propaganda and the Islamophobia and so forth that has been utilized to attack and demonize and villainize Islam today. Uh, Islam continues to be discussed, and if you factor in 9-11 alone, by example, whether, you not believe, whether or not you believe Muslims flew planes into buildings or not, the fact is that every day since, the world's been talking about Islam. And we see the manifestation in, in a very a variety of different ways. That's just one example. Thereby fulfilling the prophecy of Allah that mentioned in the Quran, as well as the final messenger of Muhammad, peace be upon him, about Islam's growth and expansion. And speaking of expansion, uh, I'm going to address uh, some key points uh, regarding the uh, creation of the universe, regarding the Big Bang, the universe initiating from smoke, as well as the continuous expansion of the universe and a few other items. Uh, Allah says in the Quran, we will show them our signs in the universe and within themselves until they know that this Quran is the truth. For those who don't know, the words for verses in the Arabic language is ayah, which literally means signs. And so Allah says, we'll show them our signs in the, in the, in the Quran, obviously. And so uh, regarding the Big Bang, uh, Allah says in the Quran, are the disbelievers not aware, challenging you to think, are the disbelievers not aware that the heavens and the earth were joined together and that we ripped them apart and we made every living thing from water? which is another point I may address here shortly. And then ask the question, will they not then believe? In the next verse, it says, and he turned to the sky when it was smoke and said to it, he said to it and the earth, come willingly or unwillingly. And they said, we come willingly. Obviously everything in submission to our creator. And this brings upon the, the fifth point. It's miraculous that was revealed in the Quran over 1400 years ago. The universe initiating from smoke as Allah just mentioned. And we see this to be manifest and true uh, over 1,400 years ago, before modern technology could prove it, Allah described the universe as being initiating from smoke. And in 1991, in the New York Times, they published an article titled, The Big Bang, Mostly Smoke. 
that describes the universe in this, this form, in, in the form of smoke. And in that article, they mention a book titled The Space Atlas by Heather and Hinbest. And on page 50, they have a photograph. And along with that photograph is a quote that says the following. A new star forming out of a cloud of gas, which is a nebula, which is one of the remnants of the smoke that was the origin of the whole universe. This is not the Quran saying it. This is years later. But this has already been revealed in the Quran 1,400 years pr prior. They go on to say in that article, that in 1974, David Schramm was a part of a young up-and-coming uh, team of astrophysicists who carefully inventoried the contents of the universe and concluded that it would continue to expand into infinity for all eternity. And so this brings on another point, the expanding universe. Allah says in the Quran, in the heavens we constructed with strength and indeed we are its expander, 1400 years prior. And in 1925, we see that the American astronomer Edwin Hubble, you can read about this on Hubble's Law Explained in studysmarter.us if you'd like to, but in 1925, the American astronomer Edwin Hubble was the first, supposedly the first to prove that the universe is expanding. He proved that there's a direct uh, relationship in this article. They said that Hubble proved that there's a direct relationship between the speeds of distant galaxies and their distances from the Earth. This is known as Hubble's Law. And so obviously unaware once again that Allah already revealed this information via the Quran 1400 years prior uh, about the universe expanding, uh, the article goes on to say the following, and I quote, there was no such information that existed before Hubble's discovery. Uh, Hubble suggested that space is expanding from the Big Bang and the acceleration of dark energy, and that galaxies outside of our own are moving away from the fastest. The ones that are furthest away are moving away the fastest. And so, this is remarkable, but it's obviously revealed 1,400 years prior to this article coming out. This brings upon my, my next point. The sky being revealed in the Quran is a, protected, a protective canopy or ceiling in some translations. Allah says in the Quran, and we made the sky a protected ceiling or canopy, yet they turn away from its wonders. And so what does this mean? And how is the sky a protected ceiling and what does science say about it? And does science con confer and confirm rather what the Quran has stated here? Well, yes, it does. In an article titled The Mag Magnetosphere on NASA.gov, they state the following. Earth's internal magnetism creates a region around the planet known as the magnetosphere. And while several planets have magnetosphere, the Earth has the strongest one of all the rocky planets. They state the following. Our magnetosphere is a vast comet-shaped bubble, and it has played a crucial role in our planet's habitability. They go on to say that life on Earth initially developed and continues to be sustained under the protection of the magnetic environment. Uh, the, mag the magnetosphere shields our home planet from harmful solar and cosmic particle radiation, as well as erosion of the atmosphere by the solar wind and the constant flow of charged particles streaming from the sun, end of quote. So in the very next verse, after Allah mentions the, the sky being a protective canopy or ceiling, he says the follow following, it is, he who, it, is, uh, it is Allah who created the night and the day, and the sun and the moon, each floating in their own orbit. And so in an article titled, proving that this information didn't exist before Hubble's telescope, uh, but Allah revealed this 1,400 years prior. And in an article titled, Five Little Known Facts About the Sun's Journey Through the Galaxy, written by Bruce Dormany in June 2020 in Forbes, he says the, the following. The sun makes, a, makes one orbit around the Milky Way roughly once every 225 million years, and is thought to have made this journey some 20 times since its earliest days as a protostar. And he says that we now know the orbital speed of the sun and its galactic orbit to be better than 2%, with two, better than 2 accuracy. And the sun is nearly in a circular orbit with a slight ellipticity of about 5%, confirming what, the law, what Allah says in the Quran 1,400 years prior. And the moon also is in its own orbit. Uh, Earth's moon and solar system.nasa.gov, they state the following. The moon makes a complete orbit around the Earth in 27 days and rotates or spins at that same rate or in the same amount of time. Uh, so we see this to be confirmed. In the, which brings upon my ninth point, changing the creation of Allah. Address the following points regarding cutting the ears of cattle in particular. That's very important. And also addressing the transgender issue in my new book, the book that I just uh, gifted Matt with, uh, Your Right to Self-Identify, My Right to Disagree. So I touch on these items in that book. Allah says in the Quran, direct your face towards the religion, inclining to truth, and adhere to the natural order of Allah upon which he created all things and all people. No change should there be to the creation of Allah. That is the correct way of life, but most among mankind do not understand. 
So I want to remind everyone that people in the 7th century, uh, if you're not aware, they used to cut the ears of cattle as part of their superstitious dedications to the idols, kind of similar to someone that would carry a lucky rabbit's foot today. So they would cut portions of animals off, and they thought that it, would do, it was some type of trinket that would do, give them some type of luck, or they would pray to it, or, or, or uh, sacrifice it to their idols. And so, while in modern times, scientists condone cloning experiments by cutting away tissues from animals' ears, and bulls in particular. Allah says in the Quran regarding this, that after he cast Satan out of paradise, that Satan responded to him, and he said, I will mislead them, meaning the people, obviously, I will mislead the people and incite vain desires in them, and I will command them to cut the ears of cattle. This is what Allah says 1,400 years ago, right? I will command them to cut the ears of cattle, and I will command them to tamper with Allah's creation. Allah goes on to, on to say, whoever chooses Satan as a patron instead of Allah is utterly ruined. Satan makes them only false promises and raises false hopes in them, but Satan's promises are nothing but delusion. Such people have hell for their, their home and will find no escape from it. So I want to remind everyone that there were no branches of, of science or studies of genetics or embryology in 7th century Arabia. There were no high-powered microscopes or cloning of animals taking place then like there is today with the, the advancement of modern technology. So we have to ask the question, what does Allah mean by he says that, he, that Satan will cause people to cut the ears of cattle. Well, I already mentioned the superstitious dedication to false deities and idols, right, in the seventh century. But in current times, in the 1990s, Dr. Jerry Yang worked for the University of Connecticut to refine the cloning of cows and bulls through the use of adult cells harvested from these animals. Uh, Dr. Yang collaborated with Japanese scientists in 1998 to clone a prized bull with cells cut away from that animal's ears. So in this ongoing vein, and these delusional efforts to better the creation of Allah or alter it in some way, we see that uh, these people are trying to seek to improve our, our God, our Creator's creation in hopes to increase cattle size and weight and high milk production and so forth. However, they're cr creating abominations when it boils down to it. According to the New York Times, they, say, they state the, the, the following. They say failure in cloning is far more common than success. And you can read about this in future uh, working.com about the advantages and disadvantages of these attempts, uh, but they say it's failing uh, overall. Now consider this vanity in regards to, uh, like, like people in modern times, people in the seventh century and the time of the prophet, peace be upon them, I mean no offense by any of this, but uh, people used to alter their appearance by filing down their teeth and tattooing themselves, getting piercings, trying to change their, their the way they, uh, their change themselves in a variety of ways. Men would claim that they're women, women would claim that they're, they're men, just like in today's world. And so in current times, we see the transgender movement uh, has males claiming that they're females and vice versa, as we see people getting lost in, in empty hopes and delusions, just like Allah says in the Quran that they would do. Because uh, the fact is, despite uh, any physical mutilation of the body or medical costuming or playing gender charades that take place, I mean no offense to anyone, but the fact is that it doesn't alter someone's DNA. Uh, the DNA is God-given, it's God-created, and it's a person's DNA that decides their, their sex, not someone's hopes and the delusions and their, the way they, they think and they feel and you know, their emotions, it's not based on that. That's, that's a false hope, uh, just as, as Allah said. Which brings upon my, my last point. When the prophet, peace be upon him, said as a sign before the, before the day of judgment that a group of Arabs, nomads uh, of the Arabs, would be competing eventually as a sign before the day of judgment, cr uh, erecting tall buildings. The prophet was asked about this in, in the, in the, uh, about the f signs of the final hour, and he said the following. You'll see the signs of the last day when you see the barefoot, naked, destitute shepherds competing in constructing tall buildings. And when asked to elaborate further, he said this group would be of the Arabs. So for anyone who's familiar with the history of the Middle East regarding this prophecy brings to mind a very specific group, the Bedouins or the Bedou. Uh, the, they were nomads of the Arabs. And in a documentary from the 1970s on Abu Dhabi and the United Arab Emirates, the narrator said that the Bedouins were a major portion of the Arabian population and that the United Arab Emirates was mostly inhabited by Bedouins just 40 years prior. And now they state that it's littered with skyscrapers. As a matter of fact, on skyscrapercenter.com, uh, it lists the 18 of the 100 uh, largest, uh, tallest buildings in the world, tallest buildings in the world, are actually in Muslim countries, with the tallest building in the world being the Burj Khalifa, being in uh, Dubai and Abu Dhabi, um, the United Arab Emirates, rather, in uh, uh, 
and okay, and the number three rank being the tallest, uh, number three tallest rank building in the world being the Royal Clock Tower in Mecca, being ranked number three once again. And so they go on to say in this article that only just over 40 years ago, uh, simple Bedouin villages existed where skyscrapers stand today. So not only is that group, just as the, the prophet, peace be upon him, prophesied, competing to erect tall buildings, they're actually leading the race. So in conclusion, I started by mentioning that the Quran guides people to consider the signs uh, in order to establish faith through reasoning and seeking knowledge and so forth. Um, and so the second point, I talked about the expansion of Islam and it being manifested above all religions. And I proved that by the studies of Pew Research Center, Islam entering every home is a sign before the day of judgment. Amen. And uh, also the signs that I mentioned about the universe that have all been confirmed with modern science. Time. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll kick it over to Matt for his 20 minute opening statement as well. Thanks so much, Matt. The floor is all yours. So, hey, thanks everybody for hanging out. It's been a long day and I'm a little ill, but I'm gonna be okay. Assuming I can read what I jotted down here. <clears throat> so is Islam true? I have a t-shirt that I've been selling that says I want to believe as many true things and as few false things as possible. It's basically the cornerstone of what I've been saying for two decades. But what do we mean by truth? Because for me, generally speaking, truth is that which comports with reality, that which is known to be so. So there's the fact of the situation. It may be true that there's a diamond shaped exactly like my head on Mars, but we have no way of knowing it. So there would be no way for us to sit here and say, oh, it's true that there's a diamond shaped just like my head on Mars. We would have to actually demonstrate that that's true before we could assert that it's true. This demonstration is important. And there's a side question that I had earlier, which was, if the debate is, is Islam true, um, does that just mean the Quran? Does that mean various tenets within Islam? I, I don't know, I'm open to any of it. I would assume that if the Quran were true, that would probably suffice. Um, but we still don't necessarily know what that means to say that the Quran, Quran or Islam is true. And by the way, if I mispronounce anything or whatever else, I'm just an ignorant fucking American and it's my fault. But if we're to say that there's a difference between saying something is true, we know something to be true, and we suspect or we think something is po probably true. And to tell the difference, by and large, we tend to use a standard of any reasonable person with an understanding of the subject, viewing the available facts, should affirm the fact is true. Now, look at the debate topics today. Generally, we're talking about competing views. Um, Destiny and I aren't in disagreement about abortion. We're just in disagreement about the best strategy with which to argue for the same position. For most of the topics, though, were value judgments where you start with a set of facts and you go from there. You know, what should we do? What ought we to? Is Islam better than atheism? Which, by the way, uh, I wouldn't have done that. I would have done humanism. But I get why we go down that path. But for most of those topics, those value judgments came from facts and not a debate about the facts. Not X is true. So. You could debate whether or not the Earth is flat if you wanted to, but that's about convincing others of your opinion about a fact, not about demonstrating a fact. You demonstrate it by getting flat earthers to test it and prove themselves wrong in a documentary, which you can watch on Netflix. The seat of this chair is 18 inches off the ground. We could measure it. We don't need to book a theater and get an audience and have a debate about the relative height from, or the, the absolute height from the floor to the base of this chair. We can just measure it. You can't show up also with your own non-standard measure. You don't get to show up with your own ruler and say, oh, this one says it's 18 inches or this one says it's 43 inches. We have to have some standard that we're agreeing on when we're talking about determining whether or not something is true, whether or not we have a good reason to believe it's true, whether or not we're in agreement or should be in agreement about whether it's true. So watch for that. What is the criteria on which Kenny and I are assessing the veracity of the claims? Is that criteria accepted uh, for the task. And by the way, I didn't ask, are you okay with Kenny? I'd yes, just, absolutely. I, yeah. I, I apologize yes. if I didn't. Yeah. Um, but you also can't point to the Quran to demonstrate that the Quran is true. That's ultimately circular. That is the book that is making the claims and you would need, it, it can record the evidence as well, but you would need external confirmation of evidence. You can't confirm claims with feelings unless the claims are about those feelings. And you can't speak um, and reference spectral evidence or divine revelation unless you can demonstrate that there actually is such a revelation or some sort of spectral evidence. 
there's an important notion within scientific concepts which branches outside of that as well, which is, has to do with falsifiability. And simply speaking, a proposition a hypothesis is not testable unless it's also falsifiable, which means in principle there must be something that would show that it, it is not true. So if you say the hypothesis is there are only white swans, that would be disproved, falsified by finding a single black swan. And that's all it takes. You could search the entire universe and if all you ever found was white swans, you wouldn't actually confirm it, uh, but you could disconfirm it by finding a single black one. That's what falsification is. You cannot have a model that is essentially a panacea, that is a one-stop answer to everything, because now there's nothing that is not consistent with that model. And so that would be falsifiable, or, or that would be, fail to be falsifiable. There's also a difference between saying a claim is true and a claim is false, or a claim is not true and a claim is not false. I've used courtroom examples before, hopefully some of you have heard them, where um, essentially, there's a difference between you're voting not guilty or guilty or not guilty, but you're not voting innocent. And while there's a presumption of innocent, if you say I'm voting not guilty, that does not mean you are convinced that the individual is innocent. I, I, I hate to kind of have to go down that road, but generally speaking, if we're going to say something is true, then the alternate position people would expect to say, oh, if, if Kenny's saying that Islam is true, Matt must be saying it's false. No, I'm saying it's not true in the sense that it has not been demonstrated to be true. I'm not convinced whether or not it's ultimately falsifiable, so it would be a mistake to say that something is false if you can't show it's falsifiable. So what are the standards of evidence that we're gonna use? If you're going into a courtroom, in some of those courtrooms it might be beyond a reasonable doubt. In others it might be to a preponderance of the evidence. But as far as I can tell, Islam doesn't even meet the lowest standards. Claims about the supernatural aren't testable. They don't even rise to the height of being able to have probable cause to bring a case to consider. You can't use spectral evidence, you can't point to divine revelation unless you can actually demonstrate that that's the case. And you can't go into a court and say God or Jesus or Allah or whoever told me to do this and expect to get acquitted. You're probably, unfortunately, more likely to receive psychiatric care and evaluation. That doesn't mean that what you said was false, and it doesn't mean that you're delusional, but it does mean that your belief has not yet been demonstrated to be true at anything beyond a rudimentary level. Are there truths in Islam? Absolutely. It would be a miracle if there weren't, that there's a, any book that contains factual information or, or, or even speculation about who we are as human beings that would manage to get absolutely everything wrong. That would be more miraculous than anything I've seen. But what portion of Islam is true? What percentage of it is true? If I have a list of 10 facts and eight of them are clearly true and two of them aren't, is the list true? Would it be fair for me to say that this is a true list? It would be more accurate for me to say this list is mostly true, it's majority true, whatever. But if that package, do we, are we gonna require absolute perfection? Because if we require absolute perfection, Islam is dead as a doornail from the beginning, as are many other religions, because there's always going to be some error, some mistake, and I'll probably get to some of them at some point. But what if the facts in question are the ones that are uniquely part of this package? Whether we're talking about Islam or Christianity or wokeism, if you have a list of things that are the tenets of this particular view or the package deal of this view, what, what if the the eight that are correct are fundamentally trivial and are true in pretty much any worldview. Um, love is good. Kindness is good. That's not anything that is necessarily tied to one specific ideology. Even if you were convinced they were true, they do not testify to the truth of the ideology that includes them beyond that one single point. For example, humans exist. There must be some explanation for that fact. Um, some people propose that a god exists as an explanation for, the, for humans existing. And some people go to a specific God. Isn't that the one that's pretty much the whole ball game? Isn't that the one that matters? Quite often, we have rather vague attempts to demonstrate that a God exists, where we're not being very specific about which God we're even talking about or what those characteristics are. It's just, hey, we look at this big universe and it seems like there's some guidance or creator, therefore there's this, and it leads to a cascade without any further evidence leading to a specific God. I would argue that you can't realistically claim that the package is true unless the uniquely distinct facts from that package 
are demonstrated to be true. The other factors are either trivially true or tangentially true. Quite often when we're engaged in these discussions, what we have are appeals to poetry, metaphor, interpretation, whenever the literal reading doesn't seem to match reality, and whenever the literal reading can be interpreted in such a way where it matches reality, that's what we get, which ends up being a win-win scenario. So anything that appears wrong is either misunderstood or context. Anything that appears right is a win. There, I'm sure some of you have probably seen websites. This is not what I'm doing, but I'm gonna go down this road for just a second of lists of things that are wonderful in the Quran, or a list of things that are wonderful in the Bible, or a list of things that are true in the Bible, or tr true in the Quran, or amazing claims that we don't understand how somebody could have actually known this. But you'll also find lists pointing out the problems with these books. If you look at a list about problems with the Quran, you may see a list of false claims, interpretations, metaphors. You might see stuff about seven earths, seven heavens, geocentricism, creation is in six, creation in six days, uh, or time periods, which is actually a meaningless distinction. The earth was created before the stars, the moon was split in two and put back together. Beautiful stars protect us from evil spirits, just like this pen keeps pixies from stealing my wishes. The sky is a guarded ceiling that can fall. Humans were made from clay. Sperm originates from between the backbone and the ribs. But what about specifics? Because each one of those could be read in a context where if you begin with the book must be true and Allah must be correct, there's some way to read that so that it matches up with reality. Even if it shouldn't, even if it wasn't intended to, there's some way to do it. All organisms were created in pairs. My understanding is that's what the Quran says. That is false. It's absolutely false. There are parthenogenic species. I'm in the process of possibly buying some um, agama, some Lelapis uh, in Gavantre, um, which I've mispronounced horribly. So I should have just gone with whiptail lizard, which is another lizard that is parthenogenic. Um, but if we only ever needed to show that one statement from the Quran was false in order to falsify the Quran in total, that's it. We're done. I'm not doing that. It's silly. It doesn't get us to where we need to be in this debate. But if anybody ever tells you there are no errors and no mistakes in the Quran, just ask them why it says everything comes in pairs if there are parthenogenic species that don't, that are entirely female. But we don't have to prove which statements are false, even if we can. They have to show what's true, and they have to show this truth beyond the trivial. I could post all kinds of factual issues that are waved off as a translation problem, but what about direct instructions that are supposedly coming from Allah? I didn't know about this. I I'm not going to pretend I know or understand it, but it is something that I read about, which is in Surah 4, 11, and 12, where it talks about dividing up your property to your children and uh, family and things like that. And if you go through and you do the math, to the male, a portion equal to that of two females, if only daughters, two or more, their share is two-thirds of the inheritance, if only one, or share is half. It continues on, and in the first verse it ends with, and Allah is all-knowing and all-wise. And then in verse 12, it goes on like with extended family and other things like that and concludes again with, uh, this is ordained by Allah. Allah is all-knowing, most forbearing. But the shares don't add up to 100% in either of those. Now, okay, maybe it's a scribal error. Maybe it's not a big deal. But I think if you're the all-knowing, all-wise governor of the universe and you're passing on your wisdom on how to divide up your, uh, your belongings, we could at least get the basic math right. But worse than that is, I find it strange to think that this is the one correct set of instructions for how to divide up your property, taking not into account you know, which of your sons worked for you and which one was more lazy or you know, any other circumstances around. If you need to know how to divide up your property, boom, it's all done right here. And it must be correct because it says that it comes from the all-knowing, most forbearing, all-wise God. If we find a human body and it's dead and we want to figure out what the explanation is for that dead body. There's a package of beliefs that we can put together, a model, a hypothesis that leads to a potential theory. To explain, for example, that the butler did it with the candlestick at 9 p.m. Even if we confirm the weapon, that does not prove that our model's correct and that the butler did it. And if we find out, for example, that the murder took place at 10 instead of 9, that also does not completely destroy the model because we can edit our model and say, hey, we're gonna revise this because we have new information and as long as we're consistent with that, we now have a new model, and we can explain the incorrect time. This is how we go about explaining things. 
We have something, we explore it, we come up with a hypothesis, we test it and confirm it, we try to falsify it. It has to come, overcome other proposed explanations. So what facts of Islam need to be demonstrated to be true? Well, I would say the existence of a God would need to be demonstrated to be true, that the God has the characteristics they cite and claim, that the specific desires and commands of that God um, are as they claim, that Muhammad was a prophet, not just claimed to be or asserted to be, but was a prophet, that this was a, someone who spoke on behalf of a God, that he was the final prophet, that the various tenets about prayer and submission and its moral pronouncements are true and accurate. And they can try to provide an incomplete picture by pointing to passages that they can't explain the origin of. Here's something in the Quran that we found that we just don't know how they could have known this. Without even, even asking the question, did they know it? Did your interpretation and in reading things into it, does this mean somebody actually knew it? Just because there's something in there that appears to be consistent with something we found later doesn't mean that the person who wrote it knew it. That's an assumption that would need to be demonstrated. Instead, what we often get, and I don't really know what we'll all see tonight, but propaganda logical fallacies that give an impression of a God, but not confirmation of the fact of a God. So where's the evidence? And they might say, okay, on atheism, how do you explain the universe? But that's neither an argument, nor is it evidence for their conclusion. Even if atheists have no explanation for the universe, that doesn't mean that theirs is correct. The majority of the population in over 49 countries is Muslim in some version. But the number of people who believe something has no bearing on what's true. So let's try this. My understanding is that from the standpoint of Islam, the purpose of existence is to worship God. How can you show that's true? If you list a, make a list of all the distinct truths or truth claims from Islam, I would say that one should be on the list, right up there with there is no God but Allah, and the, you know, to worship God is the purpose of life. That would be a core tenet of Islam. How can you show that it's true? If I have a purpose for my life, and my parents have a purpose for my life, and a God has a purpose for my life, and a government has a purpose for my life, how do we know which of those purposes is true? Isn't it my life? Am I not the one that decides what the purpose of my life is? Now, my Muslim friends will say, no, Matt, it's not your life. Your life belongs to God. Your life belongs to Allah. But that isn't true merely because they say so or because their book says so. And even if a God came down here and told me that my life belongs to him, that's merely that God's opinion. Now, I might not be able to do anything about it. He can squash me like a bug, wipe me from existence, whatever. But it's still, I still get to say, no, 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 my purpose is this. So how do you demonstrate that it is in fact true that the purpose of life is to worship God? You demonstrate this with evidence that should convince a reasonable person using standardized, accepted criteria to determine truth. You can pull out your purpose measuring device. I'm not aware of any. You can pull out your purpose detecting device. I'm not aware of any. And you can demonstrate that it is simply true that the purpose of life is to worship God and you'll almost have me. And then you can try to do the same for the other core tenets, proving angels and afterlifes and soul and the God and what the opinions about the God are. But you need to start by proving, I would say, something like it is true that the purpose of life is to worship God. Until that, I don't see how anyone can say that Islam is true. Thank you, Matt, for that opening statement as well. We'll go into the rebuttal section for the rebuttals. These are about 10 minutes with that. We'll kick it over to Kenny for that first rebuttal. All right, thank, thank you, Matt, uh, for that opening statement. And I'm, I'm gonna start with where, where uh, Matt ended because, alhamdulillah, so this is something uh, regarding the purpose of life that Allah has explained in the Quran. Uh, I mentioned to someone earlier that there's a verse of the Quran in which Allah, before he created us as human beings on earth, that he tested every soul, he questioned every soul asking, Am I not your Lord? This is verses of the Quran that, that are, are within the Quran. But he questioned every soul asking, Am I not your Lord? That each soul testified yes and said, Yes, you are our Lord. And that Allah tells us in the Quran that he created the only purpose for his, his creation of men and, and the jinn are to worship Allah. There's a specific verse that says, I have not created the men and the jinn except to worship Allah. So there's a, a clear, precise, verse within the Quran that tells mankind 
the purpose of life. It is really the only book on this planet that literally says these words, why we are created. Only to be tested by our Creator and only to worship our Creator in all things that we, that we experience. Whatever hardships we have, whatever blessings that we, we have, we're to worship our Creator in the midst of every bit of it. We're being tested by those things that we are, are given in this life and we're also tested by those things that we're denied. Now, Matt started by saying that we, had, we need to have standards that we agree upon, and I, I respect that, and obviously that's the route that I was going with my opening statement. There has to be things that can be verifiable, and that's why uh, in my opening statement I mentioned the importance of, uh, and cr the Quran actually directing us, and I mentioned the Prophet, peace be upon him, by example, also saying that seeking knowledge is an obligation upon all Muslims, because Allah is challenging mankind. To, to, to test its truthfulness with things that can be verifiable, not things where we give our opinion and so forth. I mentioned a verse of the Quran in which Allah says that there are certain verses of the Quran that are the foundation of the book. They're the clear statements, they're the foundation that we can rely upon. People of, of the most simplest of intellects can, can comprehend. And there's other things that are, that are not, they're, they're more vague and they're not specific. But those in whose heart, it says, and those in whose heart seeks is, a, is disbelief, they seek those verses that are uh, unspecific in order because they want to create discord, they want to argue about them, and because they don't believe that a creator exists inevitably in summary. But the fact of the matter is that we have things within the Quran that are verifiable, that we can uh, set a standard by, that we can test by, by modern science. Now you consider the verse that I mentioned earlier where Allah says that it is we who created the heavens and the earth and, uh, and we s split it asunder. And we, we created the heavens with strength, and we are its expander. Now, there's no other way to look at this. The word expand means expand. It means yesterday and today and tomorrow. When, when the book says over 1,400 years ago, referring to the universe, that we created the universe with strength, and we are its expander. What does that mean? That's, that, what is that going to tell the human mind to, to ponder and reflect upon? Remember, I mentioned a verse of the Quran that says, we will show them our signs in the universe and within themselves until they know that this, this Quran is the truth. That means that there's going to be a period of time where this is, is going to take place, where this, this understanding, this comprehension. People who are traveling in the days of the Prophet, peace be upon them, they could speak directly to them and they could get a more understanding about what's going on. Even though there's verses that they couldn't comprehend, what does that mean that the universe is expanding? In the seventh century, they would not, they would not know what that means. This is a sign for us. This is why the word until in that verse, we will show them our signs in the universe and within themselves until this Quran is proven to them to be true, in, in summary, it, proving that it's true. And so what is this telling us? It's telling us that there's going to be a period of time in which mankind is going to ponder and reflect on why would Allah say that we created the universe with strength, by example, and we are its expander. And well, lo and behold, we know in modern, with modern technology that the universe is expanding. No human being could have known that. This is, not, this is something that is confirmed with science, that no human being could have uh, could even guessed about in, in seventh century Arabia. Uh, they, matter of fact, they couldn't do it before Hubble's telescope was, was uh, constructed centuries later. And so we have to look at these things and, and be reasonable and say, okay, well this makes sense. This is verifiable. This is something that I can set a, a standard upon and when we consider the verses of the Quran literally in the Arabic language, as I mentioned, the verses are called ayah in the Arabic language, which literally means signs. We will show them our signs in the universe and within themselves until they know that this Quran is the truth. And so we see these things being manifested. I mentioned the, uh, uh, the, the sun and the moon being in their own orbit, by example. This is new information. This is not something that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, would have known or even had, had access to in any regard in 7th century Arabia. So we have to look and say, well, this makes sense that modern science, the, the Quran revealed this 1400 years ago, and although it took time for the Hubble telescope to come along to verify it and confirm it, it's been confirmed. It's something that we can set a standard upon and we can rely upon. And so we have to be willing to open our minds and engage in these types of things and, and look at the research and look at the studies and, and, and ponder and reflect on the things that have been revealed just as Allah, Allah has instructed mankind to do, to challenge the truthfulness. So 
There's many people who, as I mentioned the verse, uh, I'm going to mention it again, that Allah says that there's, there's, uh, there's certain verses that are, are the foundation of the book. By, by example, uh, you know, Surah Ikhlas, which is, you know, it's the, it says, inevitably, it says that Allah is the one and only God. He begets not, nor is he begotten. There's nothing that compares to him, and so forth. And so these are things that Muslims believe, and we stand upon that. There's other things that, that are mentioned that we have to uh, be willing to engage in considering what, is, what does this mean, by example. If you, if, if you place someone in, in a desert region and you ask them, or even, even today, you ask just the random individual, how much do you think clouds weigh? Well, uh, th they're just floating in the air, birds fly through them, airplanes fly through them, they look like they're weightless, inevitably. But, Allah refers to the clouds, by example, numerous times, refers to them as the heavy clouds. Well, why is that? Why, why would Allah refer to the Quran, I mean, the clouds in the Quran repeatedly as the heavy laden clouds, the heavy clouds? Well, because the cumulus cloud, by example, the average cumulus cloud weighs 1.1 million tons, I mean, a million pounds, rather. 1.1 million pounds. Most people don't know that. You don't know that because you haven't taken time to ponder and reflect on what's being revealed and how does this apply. What, what, when Allah mentions the clouds, well, let me look into the clouds and say, what, what does this actually mean? Allah mentions by another example the, about the, uh, the joining of two seas that, that come together, but they don't mix. And a lot of, a lot of people, they see a, a certain picture where it shows two bodies of water. These are called estuaries and so forth. But it's been confirmed through uh, the studies of Jacques Cousteau back in the day and so forth that the two bodies of water that they're mentioning are the Mediterranean Sea and the North Atlantic that, that meet at the Strait of Gibraltar. And they actually don't, they don't meet together like this, they meet horizontally. And the science proves it. Matter of fact, I can read the information here if need be and I'll try to get to that. But they actually meet, they meet horizontally and they have a boundary in which they do not cross because the heavier Mediterranean Sea that's more, it has more uh, salt content does not allow the, uh, the lighter waters of the North Atlantic to mix with it. And so it, it's a clear, in, in, the, in, the, in the mentioning of the Quran, it says we join these two bodies of water together. In summary, they join these two bodies of water together that have a boundary which they do not transgress. They do not cross one another. Well, lo and behold, modern science has confirmed that there's bodies of water that, that meet and they do not transgress. How could the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, know this when he didn't live anywhere close to where two bodies of water met? He nowhere close to it. Uh, where, and, and if you're just looking out in the ocean and you're looking at bodies of water, you can't see a boundary within these waters. You're floating in the water if you're on the ship and, and so forth. You can't see that. Human eye can't see that. No, the studies in modern science have proven that there's bodies of water because of their salt content that come together that do not mix. This was revealed over 1400 years ago and it is verifiable. It's a standard that we can live on. Thank you. We'll kick it over to Matt for his rebuttal as well. The floor is all yours, Matt. And are we doing two of these? Like a 10 and then a five or something? 10 and a five. Okay. The next one okay. is five minutes and then 20 minutes open dialogue and then four minutes closing. Sure, thanks. So I, Try to take good notes. Um, one of the things that we clearly have here is here's a bunch of things that are in the Quran that were told are signs, and they seem extraordinary that nobody can understand them. Now, I um, I'm, don't have an explanation for anything and everything that Kenny could bring up. Um, I've gone through lists before. Um, I was glad to see that we didn't spend any time on an embryo today because. <laughs> I would think that an agrarian civilization that raised, I, I breed snakes, and so it's really easy to find out about embryos and things like that. Um, I would also think that where water may perhaps uh, not mix well or have difficulty mixing is not all that difficult to find about or to hear about um, when you have salt water and fresh water, when you have water at different temperatures, when you are drinking from a stream that's moving versus what it flows into. But you don't necessarily have to see all those things for yourself. There are ways to discover these things, and somebody did. But at the end of the day, anything that was listed in the Quran that was a, a statement about a scientific fact in the world was not demonstrably true until it was demonstrated. The Quran didn't edify anyone 
to gain an understanding of these things. It was, hey, science eventually discovered this, and then somebody said, oh yeah, here's where in the Quran it says something like that, or something that can be read this way, or something that can be interpreted this way. And in those places where it didn't line up as well, well, that's metaphor, that's interpretation, that's different context. And so, earlier when he mentioned that um, the passage says, no one knows the true interpretation but Allah, it reminds me, I'm sorry, I'm a former Southern Baptist, uh, it reminds me of the passage in the Bible that says, that basically says that nobody knows other than God. And let every man be, or let God be true and every man a liar is the one from the Bible is the big one. And so I would extend that here as well. And that if there is an interpretation, we're gonna say whether or not it's correct, I would want to hear it from the horse's mouth, so to speak, and not from the people who've interpreted things in different ways at different times, depending on what other facts we knew about from the world. Um, Case side of the fact that Islam spread rapidly. This is amazing because that's exactly the same argument that I get from Christians, that Christianity spread ra rapidly despite them being persecuted. So now we have two different extensions of an Abrahamic religion, and it would be really convenient if they would continue down the, the Judeo-Christian trend, which Judeo-Christian isn't a real thing, it's just something people make up so that Jews and Christians work together against a common enemy until they go back at each other head to head again. Um, it's unfortunate, but this all stems from the same root. So it's really easy for them to say, well, of course there are similarities. Well, of course there are things where there are re re things are revealed there. And I have Muslim friends, and maybe we'll get to questions or whatever that would say, yes, the Quran you know, cites the Bible and references that apart from it being corrupted, you know, it's true. But the Bible also holds that it would be the last revelation. Uh, so the Mormon's last revelation of Jesus Christ, or the supposed last revelation of the prophet Muhammad, are, are inconsistent with the facts of the Bible. So I, I'm not going to go down the route that some of my uh, Christian apologist friends have done, where if you say the Quran is true, that means the Bible is true, and if the Bible is true, that means the Quran can't be true. Uh, that actually works and is a logical reductio ad absurdum, but I'm not going to, I can't hold to that because I don't see either one of them as true. I don't even see either one of them as particularly remarkable. The fact that there are things in there that can easily be interpreted to be consistent with the facts of reality is cool, and maybe we have a mystery. So like if you found an ancient book that said, Matt and Kenny are gonna argue about Islam until the cows come home. Is that a prophecy? When the waiter brings the medium rare steak I ordered, is he fulfilling prophecy? If somebody knows there's a prophecy out there and they're seeking to actually make it come true, is that still fulfillment of prophecy? Did somebody foresee it? This is why I said at the beginning, the question that often gets overlooked is, this is written down, we presume that this person knew the future, but that's only because in, we look back in hindsight and say, ah, this is consistent with the future, it's a miracle. What if it's not? What if it's coincidental? What if it is a matter of interpretation? What if it's not particularly remarkable at all? Like we, oil and water don't mix, different waters don't mix. You, you say, well, oh, heavy clouds, that could be poetic. If it turned out that clouds weighed nothing, we would be hearing that's poetic. That same passage would be viewed as poetic as opposed to literal. So we need something that clearly delineates. Is this passage literal or, or metaphoric? And just because it's there, does that mean that somebody knew or uh, made a, an actual prophecy? The fact that something is said and later seems to be consistent with a fact of reality does not mean the prophecy has occurred any more than when the horoscope in the newspaper tells me I'm gonna have a bad day and I have a bad day, that doesn't mean the stars got together and conspired to control my life. Um, the spread of Islam to every household, um, by the way, also a Christian idea. Jesus isn't coming back until God spread the word to everyone, until everyone's heard. Go ye therefore into all the world, preaching to all the nations, etc. Despite the fact that there's a village of Paraha that don't even have a God, con a God concept at all. Um, and so this question of, oh, it was revealed 1,400 years ago. I can appreciate the fact that he's convinced of that. I'm not. I don't think it was revealed 1,400 years ago. I think it was written down and then it was interpreted later. But how do you show that it was in fact actually revealed? This is where we need something clear. Now, the Quran didn't edify anybody with knowledge of the physical world. It was science that had to discover what it was and what it wasn't. And that clarified the things that were interpreted. 
But the Quran talks about, we will show them our signs. And he also mentioned about the, the actual verses being, is it ayah? Ayah. Which means signs. Ex and that's neat, except it's meaningless. Because saying something is a sign doesn't mean that it's a sign. And so what I was looking for was some confirmation of the purpose of life issue. And what I got was the book confirms its statement about the expanse and therefore it must also be right about the purpose of life. That is simply a logical fallacy. Even if the book were completely correct and even if you had good reason to think that there was foreknowledge predicting an understanding that would come about from Big Bang cosmology later, that in no way confirms that the book is also correct about what the purpose of life is. It doesn't confirm any of those things. And what's really strange to me is if you were convinced that whatever God or Allah, however you want to phrase it, gave you these revelations in such a way that it confirmed the truth of the whole book, why wouldn't that same God confirm the whole book explicitly rather than implicitly? If I have a list of 10 things that are from my mom for her to do, and my brother gives it to me, and I say, I don't believe that list is from my mom. Uh, you'll have to prove it to me. And he goes through, and he calls mom on the phone, and he reads the first six things on the list. And mom says, yep, that's my list. And he hangs up. Has he confirmed the other four things on the list? You notice he didn't ask her that on the phone. You cannot implicitly confirm things through the reliability or apparent or perceived reliability of the source. Now, I'm not convinced that the source is necessarily reliable. I can appreciate um, that my Muslim friends are. But when we're going to go and confirm what is truth, what has been verified, confirming statements one, four, five, and seven tells you nothing about two, three, and six. We need explicit confirmation for each one of the claims before we can say this is true. It may be true, but we can't say that it's true just based on, well, I think it's reliable. I mean, my mom's told me all kinds of things and some of them were true. Not all of them were true. Now, I get it. Once you're convinced that you're getting the information from the most high, that changes things but it changes things in here. And it's a bias that religions of all types have been plaguing us with for ages. Let me hide the logical fallacies from you. Let me instill confidence in you. There's a reason it's a con game, it's a confidence game. Uh, not that somebody is intentionally trying to con you, but we have all gained confidence in these supernatural claims. Every, well, all right, there's a few people who've been lifelong atheists, but. I'm an atheist now, I have no supernatural beliefs. But I was a Bible-believing, walking, talking, Jesus died for me, full-on believer, and I would have said some of the same things. It's in the Bible this way, the Bible says this, the Bible says this. If I had been raised in Islam instead of Christianity, I would have done almost the same thing with slightly different verses, and I would have been just as fallacious no matter which of those turned out to be true or neither. Thank you very much. We'll kick it into the next and final rebuttal. These are five-minute rebuttals. Thanks so much. Kenny, the floor is all yours. Okay, thank you. So, I, no offense to Matt. I, I like Matt. Uh, he's a nice guy. But that, he's given his opinion about some things. And what we need to do is we need to look at that which is verifiable. That's what I said in my opening statement, and that's what I presented here. Things that we can, we can ponder, reflect upon, that we can confirm through modern science. By example... Uh, think about what's being revealed. Over 1,400 years ago, Allah says in the Quran that he released the two seas meeting side by side. Between them is a barrier that neither, which, which neither transgresses, as I mentioned. And then ask the question, so which of the favors of your Lord will you deny? And another verse that says, and it, he, it is he who released the, the two seas simultaneously, one fresh and one, uh, and, and one sweet and one, one salty and bitter. And he placed between them a barrier and a prohibiting partition. Okay, so twice in the Quran here, it mentions a barrier that, that cannot be crossed, right? And we, so if we want to analyze that, 
And we say, okay, well, if you're claiming that a, a creator has revealed this 1,400 years ago before modern technology could confirm it, obviously out in the ocean, you can't confirm that just with your, your human senses. You just can't do it. Modern technology can confirm it, and it has been confirmed. You have to ask yourself, why would it be revealed if not to guide mankind to ponder and think and reflect on what's been revealed in order to prove exactly what he mentioned? When he mentioned about the, that's a good example about the mom leaving a, some instructions for the child. Well, we need to prove that that came from, from the source. And the, the way to prove that come from the source is to verify the signs that have been revealed that, you, that are verifiable. And by example, so I mentioned these two seas and, uh, and I mentioned earlier about the Mediterranean and the North Atlantic. This is called the halocline phenomenon. Uh, and in an article titled Mediterranean Outflow Mixing and Dynamics, they state the following. We examine the outflow that begins in the Mediterranean, Mediterranean basins, which, let me, let me read this other part. So it says a phys it's a physical phenomenon called the thermocline or the halocline consisting of two layers of water with different qualities in, of temperature and salinity. This means that they have layers that do not mix due to their different physical properties. And when you go through the separation layer, uh, the mix, uh, we, we mix the two types of water producing light refraction phenomena that give us such a perplexing s sensation of blurred vision because they, they're not actually mixing, right? And so the, these modern science has proven that these bodies of water they come together and they do not mix. Allah has revealed this 1,400 years ago. So if we're, if we're going to be reasonable, as I mentioned in the opening statement, we have to be, we have to be willing to say, let, let me consider how and what does this mean in 7th century Arabia when this book, he said he believes it was written down, obviously it was eventually written down, uh, but why would it say this? Why would it say even bring this up about two bodies of water coming together that do not mix if it's not a sign from our creator that he does indeed exist? What's the purpose of it? What other logical conclusion would you con uh, conclude? What would you come to, you know, what can you conclude about such a statement that we created these two bodies of water and between them is a barrier that does not mix? How can humankind how could that motivate someone to join a religion? How could that motivate them in any way other than to say, okay, this, I see this is revealed, and we see that the modern science has proven it. How could this, what does this mean? We have to be reasonable. We have to be willing to open our mind and say, how could this verse, why would this verse say this? And does it, is it confirmed with, in our time, in modern science? Yes, it is. It is. Now, in the days of the prophet, peace be upon him, uh, they had the luxury of living and, and, and eating and, and speaking to the prophet directly. And so their, their faith was established based on uh, the prophet's character and, you know, the things that he said, the, 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 um, the recitation of the Quran alone that was, that was just striking and they thought that he was working magic when, when the, the verses came. But uh, inevitably, so they, they had a different, uh, different uh, outlook towards it because they didn't have the luxury of the modern science that we do as a luxury to us as a sign before the day of judgment. This is, this is an, an, an effort from our God, our Creator, to, to take those people who are analytical, who are more uh, prone to question science, who are less prone to rely on just faith and so forth, uh, who aren't, aren't, aren't moved by their emotions, they need something more scientific, to, to uh, gauge and, and base their decisions on. And that is, that's why these types of verses have been revealed for these types of people. But these type of people have to be willing to open their minds uh, to, to ponder and reflect on, well, how could this information have existed 1,400 years ago? Thank you. So, I only have a handful of, of notes left that I don't want to miss. Um, one of the most important things is, is, is to touch on the fact that we need to explicitly confirm things and not implicitly. You can't just say, oh, we confirmed this thing and therefore everything that comes along with it gets in. So you also mentioned that um, Allah said that he tested every soul, am I not your Lord? Yes, you are. As if before time, before everyone that was going to exist was given this opportunity to say, yes, you're my Lord or you're not. How do you know that? How do you know that's true? How, would, how can I know that's true? Why can't a God who asked me before time if I'm his God 
talk to me now and confirm that I said that, or maybe now I can say, no, you're not. This is when you believe the book, you just take it all in stride. What is the evidence that there is a God or that that God spoke to me before time began or universe began or however that you're gonna look at it to say, am I your Lord? Now I said, yes, you were. I think I should know that. I think it's absurd to suggest that it happened without my knowledge and that I'm gonna be judged based on it. If we verify one thing, that doesn't mean we verify the other. Oh, well, Allah is challenging us. How do you know that? Because the book says. He tested every soul. How do you know that? Because the book says. Satan will cause people to cut the ears of cattle. Yeah, you talked about how they were doing that in one context. That doesn't mean that verse has anything to do with cloning. The fact that somebody else cut cow's ears again is a serendipitous, you know, hey, look, we, it's like looking at Nostradamus's quatrains and trying to figure out which one predicted JFK's death when none of them do. Now, Kenny's right. I'm giving you my opinion. That's part of why I'm here. But one of the differences is that I'm talking about what methodology can we use to verify claims to be true? I didn't come here with a list of claims that need verification. All I did was come here to, to address the claim that Islam is true. And how do we go about that? What's the methodology? Because right now, the only methodology that I've seen is trust the book. And if you find part of the book trustworthy, you should trust the rest of the book. And it starts very early in one of the first things that got written down, after no one knows interpretation, the correct interpretation but Allah, it starts with disbelievers are not aware. That's literally poisoning the well. That is literally a fallacy to suggest if you don't get this and if you don't believe it, it's because you are a disbeliever who's unaware. For whatever reason, it's, it's the same thing that I grew up with in Southern Baptist churches. God's going to reveal it to you later, maybe. You don't know that. I, this hope that when I get to heaven, everything's good, I'm going to be told everything, that's not biblical. I don't know if it's Quranic or not, but it's not biblical that you're going to find out everything. But to say, uh, are, they, are the disbelievers not aware that heavens were ripped apart and made all from water? No, I'm a disbeliever. I'm not aware of that. But even if the heavens were ripped apart from the earth, for which I've seen no evidence, and even if everything living were made of water, which isn't actually, I mean, if they just said carbon, you know, we got carbon-based life here, they'd been a little more impressive. But yeah, water's everywhere, and we all, you know, have water. Cool. Um, maybe we knew that because, you know, when you slice somebody open and they bleed, the last thing that comes out is water, uh, or that we pass water on a regular basis. Oh, oh yeah, maybe we're made. There's lots of reasons that ancient people could have reached conclusions like that. But to say, Aren't the disbelievers aware that I did all this? No, we're not. And the way we become aware of that is for you to show up and explain it and demonstrate it, or for your followers to demonstrate it with something beyond this book says so. Because I can point to other books that say other things that are somewhat similar in their impressiveness and unimpressiveness. It's not, it's not surprising to me that over the course of the history of human beings, we have tried to solve problems, and we have come up with proposed explanations. And some of those proposed explanations are going to be super versions of humans. It's really easy. I can run, you can run faster, you can run faster, somebody must run fastest. It's a natural progression to I have power, you have power, they have more power, somebody must have all power or most power. This natural progression back towards the beginnings is what we're all looking for. And the truth that a lot of people don't want to face is we hit a barrier. We have no way of investigating beyond space and time. And so that's when God's become to, a part of beyond space and time, exists beyond space and time, which may not be fair. I don't know for sure if, if Allah is considered outside of space and time or inside. I shouldn't have brought that up because that's not necessarily a fair criticism. But to say that we have good reason to believe that the rest of this book is true because we've recently become somewhat convinced of some of these passages that were called signs as if they were signs. But how convinced we are that they're signs is not in any way confirmation that they are signs. We need explicit, discrete confirmation of any and all claims, not just an implicit, these couple are correct, so let's swing them all in. Even if it got the expanse of the universe right, that doesn't mean it got the purpose right or anything else.
Okay. All right. All right. So, uh, Matt, do you mind if I open it up? And okay. So, All yours. Oh, thank you, man. Uh, so, I want to ask you a question regarding what I'm going to present to you. Uh, you'd mentioned uh, that the Quran says that the disbelievers are not aware. It doesn't actually say that. It actually is, is asked questions Great. about the disbelievers. So I thought example, I corrected that right after. If yeah. I, because it was, are the disbelievers not aware that I have split the... Yeah, have, so, so it's, a, it's rhetorical. It's trying to get actually get people to engage in what's being presented. By example, it says in regards to water, by example, you mentioned uh, everything being created from water. It's, it's something that Allah mentions in the Quran in four different verses. And by example, it says, do not the believers uh, see... So it's asking the question, do the believers not see and do they not take this information that's being presented and, and, and ponder and reflect on it? So, by, so the verse says, do, do, the, do not the believers see that, that the heavens and the earth were joined together uh, as one unit of creation in this translation before we sent them asunder, before we, we ripped them apart or sent them asunder. And then the next f statement that is made is, and we, we made every living thing from water. Four times, it, another verse says, it is he who created uh, man from water. Another verse says, and Allah created every animal from water. And, he, and another, the, the fourth verse says, uh, he, it, it, is, it is Allah who created the heavens and the earth in six days, and his throne is over the waters. And so it keeps mentioning the waters. Okay, but the, we see that this is confirmed, and this is what I want to read to you and get your opinion on this, because... Uh, we see that in regards to water and every living thing being created as water, as Allah revealed 1,400 years ago before modern science could prove it, we see uh, on Fast Facts on American Museum of Natural History, they have an article there that says the following, that the protoplasm is the basis of all living matter, and uh, the vital power of protoplasm seems to depend on the constant presence of water. This is the science saying this. Uh, it's in a book titled Lawson's Textbook of Botany, uh, the Indian edition, uh, London, 1922, page 23. But we see that they're, that they're confirming this. They say about 72% of the surface of the globe is still covered with water, and it has been estimated that it is uh, that if the inequalities of the surface were all leveled, the whole surface would be underwater as the mean uh, elevation of land sphere, you know, so it says... It, I'm, I read the part that you didn't need to hear. <laughs> Please forgive me. But it says, it says in this, this next quote, it says that all life began in water is also a conclusion to which our latest knowledge in biological science points. And so the, the science is showing that all living, all created living things were created from water. No, it's not. Yeah, well, this is what this is. No, it's is. not. I just read it. You, you, you read it, and I listened to it and wrote it down. Yeah. Because well, the protoplasm isn't made of water. It depends on it water. It depends on water. It depends on water. That's not made of water. If we're going to massage minute. this, you don't get to say, the Quran says it's made, everything's made of water, and then say science says it depends on water, because depends on water is not the same okay. as made of water. Originating from the water is not the same okay. as made of water. Water is H2O. Yeah. Everything is not made of H2O. Okay, so you remember I said that the, the verses of the Quran are called ayah, signs. And so the book, the, the Quran is a book of signs, not science. And so, as you mentioned earlier, and I agree, and Allah even mentions it in the Quran, that there are certain verses that are the foundation of the book, and there's others that are unspecific. And so because it's a book of signs and not science, it's not going to break down all that to where people who just common every, you know, everyday Joe who has no interest in any of, any of that uh, is not going to spend time to study how, you know, the dynamics of the protoplasm and the contents of it being well, it doesn't built, mention built on water or, or whatever it was. The no, 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 I'm saying in the Quran it doesn't mention protoplasm no, no, it doesn't. because it's not a science book. Right. But if it says made of water, it is an incredibly generous interpretation to suggest that you found a science book that says protoplasm depends on water and that this is confirmation of a verse in the Quran that says everything's made of water. Yeah. It's not made of water. That's well, wrong. So, so, no, it's not wrong because it says on page 15 of this source that I mentioned, the direct quote here is, living protoplasm always contains a large amount of water. Contains Therefore, water? Exactly. That's not made of water. It, it wouldn't do, exist do you understand without... the makeup of a cell? Right. The structure of a cell is not water. It can contain water. It needs the water. It can contain Otherwise, water. Otherwise, the cell doesn't exist. Uh, see, this is, this is the parade that we're going to go down no. where, where 
you are so desperate to make the Quran no. right that you will massage it to no. fit the science. No. It says made of water. That is simply not true. Well, and when I point it out, you're like, well, it contains water. Yes, but that's not made of water. Well, it, it was surrounded in water, originated in water. Yes, but that's not made of water. If, if the creator of the universe cannot inspire a verse correctly so that you and I are not in disagreement about it, then he screwed up. The, the verse says, we will show them our signs. It doesn't say we're going to break down the science. Then for you. don't break down the okay. science. But in this science, it's not a sign. If we look until at that show, science, it's a sign. If we extract those four verses that are, that where Allah mentions that every living thing is made from water, okay. and we look at the very first statement on fast facts uh, on the American Museum of Natural History regarding water, they as a matter of fact, the water H two O of life. Fast facts, and it says the very first thing that it says is protoplasm, which we've been discussing is the basis of all living matter. Yeah, I wrote and it on the, the first time. Yeah. And the vital power of protoplasm seems to depend on the constant presence of water. Yes. Therefore, the protoplasm, like the cell, would not exist without the But the verse the doesn't say the protoplasm requires no, water to function. Because it's not a book because of science. Because it's not a book of science. But you want to keep linking it to the science, because that's where it seems impressive. If it were just a statement taken at face value, it's not true. Dan Dennett has this notion called a deepity. Mm -hmm. which is a statement that to the extent that it is true, it is trivial, mundane. But to the extent that it is profound, because it often seems pr profound, it is in fact false. Like, all you need is love. That's a statement that seems profound. But to the extent that it's profound, it's actually false, because you need other things like oxygen. And to the extent that it's true, all you need is love, that's a trivial statement that this is what, who we are. Okay, so based on this, based on this statement, I'm going to read it again so everyone, so we're clear on it. Protoplasm, this is not me saying it, it's not the Quran saying it, this is the science saying it. Protoplasm is the basis of all living matter, and the vital power of protoplasm seems to depend on the constant presence of water. So my question to you, if we take the water out of the protoplasm, does the protoplasm exist? It doesn't function anymore, it probably still exists, right. because the water isn't well, part of it. Just like if you take the water out of me, my body still exists and it probably won't, well, it definitely won't function anymore. But my water, my body isn't made of water. But it do you contains see, water. it says it seems to be dependent that upon dependent, the presence of water. That's what dependent water. means. Yeah. If I'm dependent on oxygen, that doesn't mean I'm made of oxygen. Well, I realize that. But without the oxygen, you don't exist. Well, that's true. Right. And without the, without the water, the protoplasm well, doesn't exist. The human I, being, I would still exist if you took the oxygen away. I would just be dead. Do you know how, how much of your body content is water? Do you about have any, 70%. It's actually more than about 78 to sure. 85%. So without the water in your, in your body that exists in the human, in the adult body at 78 to 85 percent, you don't exist. The water is necessary. It's necessary. Yeah, but I'm not made of water. The, the vast majority of what, what constitutes you I get it, you but there's water. also a whole lot of other organisms in my body, too. Yeah. I'm made up of a lot of things that aren't even human. It, it, does it not strike you um, as remarkable in that this, these, are, these are verses that were revealed 1,400 years ago before we knew what, it, what a protoplasm was. That a man in the desert, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, peace be upon him, that he was in the desert and he's telling people in the desert that all living things, where it very seldom rains, we're telling them that every living thing is made of water. Now, he's no. not, he, it's not him saying it, he's being, it's being revealed to him from Allah. But the point being is he's reciting these verses to people in the desert and he's telling them that every living thing is made of water. And how would they, what, how would they even benefit from that? It's not, it wasn't for them to benefit from. They take it, they accept it. That's why the verse goes on to say that those of understanding, those who trust the prophet, peace be upon him, those who have engaged in the study and done the research and looked into these things that I've personally done, and to say, well, how is every living thing made from water? Yes, I realize I've heard Muslims say it. Would, would you I've think it would be fair yeah. to say that what the verse is saying is that everything living thing depends on water instead every, of is made of. In, every living thing depends on water. Well, it's the same thing. No, it's, it's not. Yeah, every but living thing well, is If it's the same thing, then, then you're, you're saying yes, those oh. are fair. No, I don't think it's remarkable at all that a bunch of people who live in the desert, who know what it feels like to be parched, who know what it feels like to be without water, would say that every living thing depends well, on water. Well, no, uh, that's, that's a good point. That's a good point. But let, let's, let's equate that to a brick house. Does the brick house exist without... The, the, the concrete, obviously it doesn't. So if you say in order to build this brick house, we have to have concrete or the, otherwise the brick house doesn't exist. I can build a brick house without mortar. Well, <laughs> a, 
wooden house. If you don't have I the wood. I can build a wooden house without mortar. Okay, well, here we go. And but without nails. You can build a, a wooden house Happens nails. all the time in Japan. They can do entire construction with nothing but wood. If you understand the point that I'm trying to make, if you can't, if you, if you, uh, it goes back, go back to the pro protoplasm. When they, they are saying that the dependent, the, that the protoplasm is dependent on the water. Mm -hmm. That means like fuel for a vehicle, it doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't, it can't function. It's it not going to work. The fuel. If it's not going to work, water is fuel. Water is not the fuel for protoplasm. The water is the fuel for you. No, it's <laughs> water not. Water is the fuel for me. Water is not the fuel. If we don't have fuel, we don't That's function. not the function of water in the human body. It's not fuel. Food is the fuel. If we can live longer without food than we can water. Y correct. But you take away either one of them and you're going to die because well, water exactly. is not you, fuel. You can't live on water alone. So you prove but the you point. But you could live on food alone because food already contains water. But well, water you, is not the fuel. So, right, what's, so what's the point? The, the point being is that this is something that Allah says, we will show them our signs in the universe and within themselves until they know that this, this Quran is the truth. And so we have to be willing to say, okay, what does this mean? When, as I mentioned, Allah is telling people in the desert that all living things were made from water. What does that mean to them? Well, we see that the studies of, of in modern times have proven that this protoplasm, the cells that exist, none of it works without the water. And that's a, that's a, that's a proven fact. I, I don't find it remotely remarkable. I've already addressed that. Well, I don't find it remotely remarkable that people would understand the value of water. Yeah, well, th there's a verse of the Quran that says, as for those who disbelieve, it matters not if you warn them or do not warn them, they will not believe. Allah said, yes, a seal over the, the poison of the Allah, well. Allah that basically says, you're just too blind to see. No, well, I'm, what I'm saying is, as, as I mentioned the verse that, uh, a moment ago, and I don't mean to offend you by saying it's that. Not an, it's not an offense. Yeah. It's that we're going over the same thing over and over and over No, again. we're actually not. We're not going over the same thing over and over again. What, my, point, my point that I was trying to establish, and I believe I have established in this debate, is that we have to go to the things that you mentioned earlier that are verifiable. I totally, totally agree. And that's why the Prophet, peace be upon him, told and, and stated that it's an obligation upon all Muslims, whether they do it or not, it's their obligation to seek knowledge. Allah, Allah challenges mankind to seek knowledge and to consider that which has been revealed in order for us to, to gauge um, and base our, our belief not on a blind faith, not just because I want Islam to be true. If I come across something that is verifiably wrong, then I have a problem with Islam. But I have not seen that. Now I've heard people make, make random claims and so forth that once I have studied in depth the, the issue that we're, we're discussing, and it's a wide, I mean, that's why I opened up and said it's a wide range of topics that we could discuss. Obviously we gotta fight one battle at a time. We're not gonna be able to address all this during this debate. But what we have to be willing to do is look at the things that are verifiable and start checking them off the list. Check them off the list. Check I'm, them I'm off happy the list. to look at the things that are verifiable yeah. and check them off the list. Yeah. I don't see that we've done that at all. Well, I think, I think we have. If you factor in um, that the things that, that are mentioned, I think you conceded that the, about Allah mentioning uh, inevitably. I'm not conceded. aware that Allah has mentioned anything. Well, well okay, well, you, you believe that the Quran, someone wrote down 1,400 years ago that the universe is expanding. And you do I believe, believe that there's a passage in there that could easily be understood and interpreted as the universe expansion. I do not believe that there is an expansion in the Quran that explicitly, or a passage that explicitly says the universe is expanding no, because I that concept wasn't you. there. That's it, it specifically yeah. says, it says it is we, meaning it's a royal decree, I Allah is the only one. So it is Allah who created the universe with strength and, and we are indeed its expander. But that's the claim. No, that's, it's, uh, that's no, what no. it says. The fact that somebody makes a claim that God expands the universe is not true just because the universe expands. But, is, but, it's, but it's true that the universe it, expands. No, it doesn't matter. So if the book says, I make the rain, okay, the existence of rain does it not does. prove that, the yeah. existence of rain does not prove that passage, does it? If the book says, I, Allah, make the rain to fall, and the fact that the rain falls does not confirm that that's Allah doing it. Don't you think that we need to factor Why can't you in? Answer the question. Well, well, I, I'm, I'm answering it, but I'm, I'm answering it with a. Okay, so. Does the passage, does the existence of rain mean the passage I Allah make the rain to fall, 
Does that mean that the passage is true? Yes, it does. No. Does the existence of rain does not confirm the cause of the rain. That's, that is a logical fallacy. No, it's not. It is one of the most ridiculous things no, anyone not. has ever said. No, it's not. Yes, that's it is. It is logically you. constructed no. as a fallacy. No, sir. That's why I was going to ask you, do, should we not consider that, so you're, you're putting a, 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 a modern logic. spin on this. No, hold on. I'm using logic to address a simple syllogism okay, so, that is fallacious. So remember, remember. If X, let's then not, Y. Let's not, let's not factor out that this is about the expansion of the universe. This no, is mentioned. Hold on, I asked hold on. about rain. Uh, we're going to talk about that. The same thing applies. Either one. No. Either one. Allah, Allah does say that. The content is irrelevant. So Content is always irrelevant let, let to fallacies of structure. Allow me to make my point. And then, and so I, I in regards to the rain. all of this 20 minute period. <laughs> we've been going back and forth. So in regards to the rain and the expansion of the universe, both of those things are mentioned in the Quran over 1400 years ago. So should we exclude the, the, the fact that they are mentioned in the Quran, whether you believe there's a, a creator or not, someone wrote down in the Quran that the universe is expanding and that everything is made from water and that it was Allah who sends down the rain. Those things have been mentioned, right? So in regards to the expansion of the universe and everything being made from water, by example, we see that that is indeed the case based on the science that I've proven here. Uh, in, in regards to, we know that, that the Hubble telescope, the invention of the Hubble telescope and their studies, it shows that the, the universe is indeed expanding. So do we factor out 1400 years ago that it stated that and pretend that it, it's, it means nothing? It's absolutely not relevant and it's not relevant to logical fallacies. If the, if the argument is, I, God, create the rain, the existence of rain does not and cannot confirm the truth of that statement. That is logic of fallacious. Do you agree? It, that 1400 is, this years is not, ago. This is not a, 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 a the 1400 years is no. irrelevant. That's not, this is about a logical fallacy. You want it to be irrelevant no, no, because no, that this, it, it's it, not relevant. This is about a logical fallacy. No, it's this not. is why. I, yes, it. it okay, would you stop telling me what I'm talking about? Okay, go ahead. I'm talking about a logical <laughs> fallacy. Go, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I came up with an example. What if there was a, let me pick another one okay. that is definitely not in the Quran okay. so that you can turn your head away okay. from that book. No. If the book says, I jump in Jehoshaphat, create poop. Does the existence of poop confirm that jump in Jehoshaphat created poop? See what you're doing. You, you're, I'm asking uh, a question. It's no, not in, that, not in that sense. No, no it doesn't. I'm, but, but. What you're trying to do is you're trying to avoid the fact that 1,400 years ago. Jesus H. Christ. Hold on. Hold on. No. Bear, bear with me. Bear it's with about me. logical fallacies. No, hold on. I removed no. it entirely from what the context. What you're trying to do. No. This is logic 101. This okay. is any first year logic student no. would understand this fallacy. Everybody out there watching now understands this fallacy. I was not trying to talk about the 14 years. I, I was know trying you don't to want get to us to a point that. where I'm, we could understand what a fallacy was, doing, but you don't. No, I do understand what no, it you is. No, you don't, what sir. You're, what you do not. What you're claiming is a fallacy is you trying to, what you're doing is creating a red herring, trying to avoid the issue. No, sir, yes, you, I'm yes, not. You and you probably shouldn't reference fallacies by name when you don't listen, fucking know them. Listen, now, see, you're, you're getting a little upset. And, yes, and, because you keep going defeat. back to irrelevancies. That's and you a sign of defeat. It's a sign of defeat. That's a sign of defeat. I lost, everybody. I lost. Because I've the fact lost of the matter is, I don't, I, what? the fact of the matter is, over 1,400 years ago, it is revealed in the Quran that the universe is expanding. One minute left. I haven't got to ask my you question. Don't wanna, you don't want to talk about that. You want to pretend that that's that. I was asking that's about irrelevant. a logical fallacy. Right. That's not a logical fallacy. That's a fact. That my before, my thing that I pointed out was a logical fallacy, and you avoided it you created, every you, single time. No, I didn't avoid anything. Yes, sir, you did. You're, you're, you're avoiding lying the, right now. No, I'm, no, I'm not. You are absolutely you are avoiding the telling fact. a lie right now. No, sir, I am not. No, sir, I'm not. The question about the fallacy on every... Rewind it. Watch no. it. Yeah, rewind it. Rewind it 20 times and play it back 20 times. Sweet. What you're avoiding and what you're trying to avoid is the fact that the Quran mentions this, whether you believe it came from a creator or not, you believe that someone wrote it down 1,400 years ago, do you not, that it says that the universe is expanding. That's what I the verse says. I answered that question. Yes, so you, you agree. three times, So you fact. agree that the universe is expanding in the Quran over 1,400 no, years sir, ago. No, that's not what I said. Okay, but okay, okay. But, but does it... Do, Okay, you agree that I don't that know how to that. deal with someone who will not address the question that I've asked at Listen, all. Listen, 
You, what you're doing, Matt, is you're trying to avoid the issue. I wish you'd stop telling me what I'm trying to do well, because I'm, it's obvious what I mean, you are, in I, fact, trying to do. No, I'm telling you for a fact that you're avoiding it. Yeah, we got to jump to the closing statement so that I don't get my question during the 20 minutes of discussion at all. <laughs> okay, so I opened the debate. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, James. Uh, so I, I want to thank Matt for engaging in this debate. Uh, I still like Matt, and so I opened I like the debate. You too. Thank you, thank you. So I opened the debate uh, discussing uh, the fact that Allah causes us, calls mankind, challenges mankind to uh, ponder, think, and reflect in order to establish faith, to rely upon uh, what's verifiable, uh, and I believe that I've done that with the points that I, I brought up. The science speaks for itself. Um, and so I've proven that in my, uh, during this debate. Uh, so the other things that I mentioned were about the, uh, the Quran saying that the, uh, that Islam would expand. And we see that it is the, based on Pew Research Center, that it is the fastest growing religion in every world today. Uh, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said that Islam will enter every household in some capacity, uh, topics of discussion inevitably. Uh, as a sign before the Day of Judgment. And I mentioned 9-11 alone and whether or not you, you believe Muslims uh, flew planes into buildings or not. People are talking about Islam. There's a lot of Islamophobia in the world and we've heard uh, throughout the course of this debate uh, a lot of things mentioned about Islam just in this debate alone. I also mentioned the expanding universe and the Big Bang, um, the sky being a protected ceiling or a canopy, and I mentioned the magnetosphere which is proven by science. Allah says in the Quran that he created the sky to be a protective, protective canopy for the earth, and we have a protective canopy called the magnetosphere. Uh, and so we can try to avoid the fact that it was mentioned 1400 years ago and pretend that that is not a, a something to factor in, but it is something to factor in because the original statement and the original proof that we have that there is a protective canopy for the earth, which is the magnetosphere, was revealed 1,400 years ago. These are things that we have to, to be willing to, to uh, look, look at and, uh, and be willing to be reasonable whenever we do so. Uh, so I also mentioned the sun and the moon being, being in their own orbit, another sign that was revealed in the Quran that specifically says that the earth and the moon are in their own orbit, and modern science has proven that indeed they are. And so I also mentioned that the as a sign before the Day of Judgment, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said that the barefoot, destitute Arabs, uh, uh, nomads, would be competing to erect tall buildings as a sign before the Day of Judgment. And in fact, they're not only competing, they're leading the race uh, in constructing these, these tall buildings. 18 of the 100 tallest buildings in the world are in Muslim countries. How would the Prophet, peace be upon him, know that if he wasn't indeed a prophet given prophecies? Obviously, he was. So I challenge. Uh, um, people to ponder, think, and reflect on the, the Quran with care, and I ask people to be a reader and not a repeater. Don't just repeat what you heard. Everything in this life is a test. In my mind, Islam is definitely the answer. Submission to our, our God or Creator. I ask you to consider Islam for what it is instead of rejecting it for what it is not, for what you've been told to believe that it is. I actually seek knowledge for yourself, and I invite everyone to consider Islam. Thank you. Thank you, Kenny. We'll kick over to Matt. 1,400 years, 1,400 years, 1,400 years, 1,400 years. Ponder, think, and reflect. I'd like to encourage everybody to ponder, think, and reflect about logical fallacies, about sound reasoning and sound epistemology, about the difference between explicit confirmation and implicit confirmation, and to stop being so obsessed with the age of an idea and start being concerned about the veracity of the idea. Thanks. Thank you. 
to the original author. So how do you not, how do you know that you're not just sort of like utilizing something that would have never been understood in 1400 years ago by the original audience of, uh, of you know, the origins of Islam and now accommodating to what science is, has said and clarified in terms of our ancient cosmology? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Thank you for that. Uh, so I mentioned that uh, the verse of the Quran in particular says that Allah says that we will show them our signs in the universe and within themselves until it becomes clear to them that this Quran is the truth. I mentioned that the, the, the uh, people in the days of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, um, they would have no way to verify science. They didn't even know what science was. They were desert nomads and, and so forth. They had no uh, means to, to study these things. So when uh, uh, it's revealed in the Quran that the sky is a protective canopy, um, you know, what you could factor in just common sense type things that, you know, this, this, the, the clouds uh, shading us from the sun. I, you know, I can't tell you what they would be thinking at that period of time. But the fact of the matter is that they were walking and talking with the prophet. They trusted the prophet and peace be upon him. And so uh, they were more prone to not rely on the, the uh, scientific evidence in order to establish faith. They trusted the prophet, peace be upon him. They believed what he was, what he was revealing. Uh, the things that, that were being revealed in the Quran, especially in the Arabic language, the way it was being revealed was remarkable uh, of the time, at the time. Uh, still remarkable for that matter. Uh, and so they just trusted what was being revealed even though they didn't fully understand everything. There are, there are thousands of hadith that explain certain things. As I mentioned, uh, one of the signs before the Day of Judgment being that the destitute Arabs would be uh, eventually competing to erect tall buildings. At the time when it was revealed, it, they were, you know, very, very poor. They were, they were, uh, they certainly weren't uh, competing to erect tall buildings. But as a sign before the day of judgment, eventually it was going to come to pass. So there's things in the Quran that have been revealed uh, for our benefit in. The later times, we believe the prophet, peace be upon him, is the final messenger. He's the last prophet to come before the day of judgment. And so surely these last things would be, um, in our time, would be able to be verified through the science. And so, by example, to answer your question in regards to the magnetosphere, the, the, the Quran says that we have uh, created the sky as a protective canopy. And, well, it, almost word for word, they're saying that the magnetosphere protects this planet from harmful radiation and so forth, things from, uh, from, uh, from space and, and so forth. So uh, that's my answer. Sure. I can tell you that there's been these 1,400 years ago when we looked up at the Quran and a number of other ancient literature that's based on, they are not, the Quran does not say that the universe is expanding. What it's referring to both with the canopy, with that and the, the reference to the canopy that you were talking about, well, then that appears to be something that says in the Bible where God stretches out the heavens like a tent. So the, te the tent, in this case, the heavens that it's referred to is the solid crystal dome that is the firmament that the flat earth belief used to hold. That there was a solid crystal dome over the earth. But that's not my question. My question is, does semen come from between the backbone and the rib? Okay, so this is not a uh, uh, topic that, this, that's a very long question to answer. Uh, that's not something that uh, I want to, am equipped to do today, but uh, um, yeah, I'm going to pass on that question just simply because it's, it's, that's a long discussion within itself. I won't pass on it. The answer is yeah. no. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Well. There's, there's a lot more to it than just No, there's that. not. <laughs> sure there is. There's sure. no more to it at all. Sure, sure there is. Okay. My testicles are below my backbone uh, unless I'm standing on my head, and they're not between my backbone and my ribs. The verse says, and that's where the testicles okay. cut, produce the semen. It, just, just quickly, the verse says that, uh, that the, the human being proceeds from in between the backbone and the ribs. And we've been talking about water. The word in the Arabic language is ma, right? And it, it means literally, it means water. It's not talking about semen at all in that verse. So that's why I'm telling you this. It's a, a much bigger discussion than it's context uh, and interpretation. Yeah. Well, no, the, the the literal Arabic word means water. It's not talking about everything. Sin. Means water, evidently. I'm telling you, it's a fact that the 
word in the Arabic language is ma, and it means water. If you go to an Arabic restaurant and, and ask for ma, they're going to bring you some water. They're not going to bring you a glass of semen. The verse does not say that, it, that semen proceeds. <laughs> okay, so uh, that's just the fact of the matter. It's talking about water, and it's talking about the fluids that travel through the, through the spinal cord. It's a long discussion. Uh, we can have that discussion some other day. It's just too, it's too much. Okay. Okay. No, it's actually talking. It's actually talking about water. The ma. Okay. Well, well, we'll talk about it. Sounds like sounds like something to, something to discuss. Yeah, that's why I didn't go down this road. Well, that's that one's yeah. You know. Listen, in regards to Islam, I'm looking uh, for anything that can be proven false. And because uh, this is something that Allah is challenging, challenging us over and over again to find something that's verifiably false. Now, we're not talking about someone putting a twist on things and, and they're just giving their opinion and so forth, but something that's verifiably false. So when I look at each of these topics, I go to the science. I, I, I step away from Muslim sources. I don't want to go to the Muslim sources. I stay away from the Muslim sources, period. I go to the science, and what does the science say? So I look up, what is it saying about uh, a protective canopy for the sky? I might just Google that. I'm looking at the weight of the clouds. I'm looking at the two seas coming together. I'm looking strictly at the science. And then I, I look at it and I say, well, why would Allah say this? Why would Allah mention the heavy laden clouds, the heavy clouds, the heavy clouds, when they appear to just be floating? But they uh, mentioned earlier that it's 1.1 to actually 3.3 million pounds, the, the average weight of the cumulus cloud. When you look up at the clouds, you would never imagine without, especially without modern science proving it, you would never imagine uh, that these clouds weigh millions of pounds. It just doesn't add up, I mean, if, we, if we're honest with ourselves. If, we, if you do think on that level, you think on that level because you have been schooled o about it. People in the desert back in the day, and if we had, we exclude any science that we've been exposed to, we don't know anything about it. But that's exactly why we need to go to the science and find out, well, what does this mean, the heavy laden clouds? I've heard what the Muslim scholars are saying that it's, it's referring to. Let me see what the weight of these clouds are. Let me see why, does this add up? Does this make sense? To me, it makes sense. So that's, that's verification, by the way. And I reject the claim that nobody would have imagined that. All you need is a bucket of water and the realization that water comes from the clouds and you can then extrapolate, which is exactly how we got from A to B. And the fact that maybe nobody, it wasn't perhaps common knowledge or nobody recognized that 1,400 years ago, um, somebody 1,400 years ago could have at least hypothesized along those lines, even if they didn't necessarily have a way to test it. Or it could have been poetry, or it could have been something else, and it's only post hoc that we're interpreting it that way. That's the problem with verificationism. Yeah. I'm just, you just factor in, you look up at the sky, birds are flying through the, through, through the clouds, planes are flying through the clouds, they appear to be floating there. And I don't think that someone would just naturally just look up, I mean, be honest with yourself, you, you, you draw your own conclusion. Uh, just because Matt says that he thinks that someone would do this, uh, doesn't mean so. Just it doesn't Kenny mean doesn't, doesn't, doesn't think somebody not, would. Doesn't mean that's wouldn't. what I was about to say. Doesn't mean, but you draw your own conclusion, and and take it from there. That's the all. Thing it is, you don't need to listen to what either one of us say. You can figure it out for yourself. Well, that's what I just said. Figure out what's reasonable by looking at the evidence and seeing if there's a way to disprove his assertion that nobody would have thought of that. Would you look at? You, question yourself, in summary, for me. Qu question yourself if you when you look up at the clouds, without this information that we've discussed today. Would you conclude that those clouds weigh millions of pounds? You, you, you decide for yourself. No. 
Yeah, no, I, pr I appreciate your question, but no, I don't think someone would conclude from a bucket of water that the two C's don't mix. It's the, an it's the analyzing the salinity uh, within the waters themselves that no human eye uh, and no human sense could do. That's it's, not true. You can no. go to YouTube and watch a video of it right now. Yeah. You right. can see it with your eyes. Yeah. In, in, in current times, you can see it, right? You think that the okay, laws of physics changed and you couldn't see hold it on. 1,400 years ago? Hold Are on. you kidding me? Hold on. So, hold on. So, he just brought up YouTube. That's modern technology, correct? I'm saying uh, he you said, could go she, look she on YouTube. She brought up someone get, dipping some, a bucket into some water. For one, somebody could see for it one, when they were in the ship there, right? For one, if you if you got a bucket and you're out in the ocean and you're dipping it into water, what body of water are you dipping it into? How would you look? At, you dip it into the water. I'm and sorry. Now you're gonna I didn't say her bucket that, example was correct. No. I said you could see well, it. We're addressing her her bucket. Question. We're, we're addressing the fact that well, she you suggested you couldn't see it. Yeah, yeah, right. So regarding her bucket question, no, if someone was out in the water and they dipped the bucket into some water, they're not going to be able to look in that bucket and see that there's a difference and these waters aren't mixing. They're not going to be, be able to see that. They For see one, it before more to they put the bucket that. in there. These, these two bodies the of water in the, in the Strait of Gibraltar, the Mediterranean and the North Atlantic, they're going in, they're, their flows are different for one. Their flows are different, and the buoyancy of the upper water is is uh, would not allow it to mix with the with the denser lower water. And that's a fact. This, the science says it. Uh, yeah. And there are other places in the world where the water does that. Yeah. Even here in America. Yeah. And it's not a sea. It's not like the yeah. In the, water. in the Quran, it mentions the two seas, and this is this is my conclusion. There's been there's a, it's a debate amongst Muslims. I've seen that. And that's what, that's what I was talking about. That, that's yes, the, the, you can see it. Yeah, hold on. That's the debate. Of, that's in the estuary. Could you have seen it 1,400 on. years ago? Hold on, hold on one second. Hold Could on you one have second. seen it 1,400 years ago? Hold on. Not out in the desert. Correct. You right. can't see this out in the desert, right. just like you can't see the moon well, when well, you're underground. Well, thank you. So you conclude, the, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, did, if, did if Muhammad it, if it, ever meet anybody on, who may if have it seen was, it? Let me answer, I'll answer your question. So the Prophet you Muhammad, peace be upon him, as I mentioned earlier in the debate, did not live in an area where two bodies of water came together anywhere. He didn't, he lived nowhere close to an area where two bodies of water came together. Even if someone that did live in areas where two bodies of water come together, there were no boundaries. How would they know which water they were in at that period of time in the seventh century? They did not know that. So there were no, these dividing lines that we have now, they would not know that. So the specific uh, there's a debate amongst Muslims themselves about the estuaries and so forth, and th these are showing that the bodies of water, just like the, the picture he brought, is showing the bodies of water coming together like this. But lo and behold, the two bodies of water that mix in a vertical, in a, a vertically, uh, not vertically, horizontally rather, excuse me, they mix horizontally, they, don't, they actually don't mix. They meet horizontally, but they don't mix. Because one's flowing one direction, one's flowing another as they're filling the Strait of Gibraltar. In the science within it, look, look it up uh, whenever, um, and you'll see that they state, matter of fact, they have a, a, da a dashed line in some of the graphics that demonstrate, demonstrating that these two bodies of water are coming together, and because of the density of the Mediterranean water being more, has, having more salinity, that it does not mix with the upper waters of the North Atlantic. They're, for two reasons. One, because they're, they're, they're crashing against each other this way, and also because of the buoyancy uh, and difference in salinities. That's maybe a, instead of it, maybe instead, hang on, nobody called on you to ask shit, so stop. But maybe instead of a debate between Muslims about salinity and water, we should have it between scientists, but go ahead. So, yeah, well, the science speaks for itself. And so, by example, let me give you an example. Um, uh, Allah mentions in the Quran that the, uh, uh, I, please forgive me for not memorizing the verses, but it's referring to the ants that communicate by speaking to one another, that they, they actually have a language in which they, they speak to one another. This is something that's been proven with science, that they, the ants actually communicate, they, 
They have, they have a language. That might seem, seem silly to some people. Hold on. But there, but there are things that are mentioned in the Quran that are unlike any other book. Have you, have you read the Quran first and foremost? If you haven't read it, you should read it and you'll see, you'll understand. So you have to read it and, uh, and reflect on what's being said and do your own study and research. Uh, I'm not asking you to believe anything that I say uh, and believe what I believe. What I'm, cha what I'm challenging you to do, because Allah challenges us to do the same thing, and I challenge myself on a daily basis uh, to ponder and reflect on what's being revealed and let me try to find something that's wrong in it. And, and, and I have not done that. With the Bible, it's not the same, it's not the same issue. The Bible is filled with, with mistakes. I was just trying to, well, the, the, I was trying to use that as an analogy to say that without the, basically without water, we don't, we can't, we can't make it. I mean, obviously we need, we know we need water, but it's deeper than that. Our cells need the water. Uh, every, every, name a plant, let, name any type of animal, name anything, it must have the water. Now, this being revealed 1400, in, in modern times, it's, it's more common. Of course, people were thirsty in 1,400 years ago. I realize that. But when it, it's not saying that you're going to die of thirst if you don't have water. It's not saying that. It says that every living thing was created from water. And so, for what, first and foremost, that's a remarkable thing to say. Because it's not that, true. Well, well the sci I just we talked about it the earlier. Science the, science not say, the science does not say that every living thing was created from water. Extract that the water. Is simply, extract the water. That is from not what it means to say X everything was created from water. Extract it's the water from every living thing. You can every spin living it however thing dies. you want. It's not true. Extract the water from every living thing and it doesn't exist. Correct. I've never, if you've never disputed that, neither has anybody else. But it doesn't mean that everything was from, created from water. It's, and it's on the statement earlier about people uh, genetically uh, modifying cows in order to try to improve on creation, we have improved on creation. Absolutely. Whether it's creation or evolution, we absolutely have. Look up Norman Borlaug and dwarf wheat that saved billions of lives. One man engineered a better wheat than evolution or any god and saved billions. It is trivial for us to improve upon the world that we live in. That's what we do all the time. That's why our lives are longer now, except for if you want to go to the fictional 900 year lives uh, in ancient holy books. So I have, no, I have no interest in your question or comment at all. I'm not going to answer you. I'm going to talk over you because you're drunk and obnoxious and you need to leave. If you come near me, I will knock you the fuck out. Go away. Get out of my face, you absolute clown. Go get a cab home, you drunk motherfucker. I don't care, you act drunk. Man, way to go. Man. Hey, you know what's never happened in one of my debates? Yeah, keep yelling. Man, does he, does he always harass you like that? Is he what? Does he harass you like that a lot? Yeah, it's, um, he's uh, upset about things. But you know what's never happened in one of my debates is that there's no discussion that broke out amongst the audience about which reality TV shows I screwed up. Mm -hmm. But yeah, he's, uh, there's some people who don't like me. There's, there's, I'm glad got, you like me. I, like I do like you. We disagree. <laughs> I, 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 yeah, but I that's some like. shit. Yes, sir. Sorry for that, by the way. The what? The what now? There are certain instrumentations that live inside of volcanic pools. Uh, I don't remember exactly. Yeah, yeah. Extreme of bottom. Yeah, yes. Extreme of bottom, sorry. And are you saying they don't have any water? They don't have any water and they're made of sulfuric acid. So what? So I, I don't, that's something I have no clue about. But uh, mm -hmm. uh, again, is, is it something that's living? Yeah. Uh, so. Well, we'd have to look at the science on, you know, on it. I, I have no clue what you're even saying. No offense to you. Uh, I have no clue what 
say, what is it again that's in there? Uh, uh, Extremophile. By the way, are tardigrades too small to contain water? No. no. They're called water bears, so I was concerned that they were the size of a drop or less. That's yeah, good. Still another thing, made of water. It's made of water? No, I'm just... No. In the sense that you were using the term, yeah, tardigrades, yeah. I okay. just wanted to know it. I knew they were called water bears, and I knew they were incredibly small. I just didn't know if they were smaller than yeah. a molecule of water or not. And they're well, not. See, see, but th see, all these things, these things are positive, and I do like Matt, and I think he likes me as well, but uh, these, thing, these, these types of discussions are necessary in that you know, like I want to know what you're talking about I, because I want to know is this a, an actual living thing and how does it be, how does it come into existence to begin with, and is water part of that process if it's indeed a living thing, and so you know that's something that as a on a personal level I like to hear about those types of things because I, I'm going to go and I'm going to look at look it up and I'm going to research it and I encourage everyone else to do the same thing. But in in order to do, do that, you have to be willing to accept um, a difficulty if you know the truth isn't always comfortable so if I come across something that is contrary to my belief I have to be willing to put my belief to the side and say you know although it makes me uncomfortable the facts are speaking right here and I, I can't argue with the facts I completely you know? agree and so that's that's all I'm trying to encourage people to do uh, in this whole debate is just to look at look at facts ponder and reflect on what's been revealed and do your own research for it I wish you could go longer but we I'm about to collapse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I do like the man. I, I, like I got a lot of respect for yeah, you. And these things are just, you know. Yeah. But that was a logical fallacy. Watch it back. You'll no, see. You gotta, you gotta, it's a fact. Somebody's going to give you a lie for that. No, it's and, not. And it wasn't, gonna, it wasn't to disprove anything. It was to talk about this fallacy so that I could move on to the next point. But you wouldn't do it. You were, <laughs> it's a fallacy. I teach logic. I teach logic. <laughs> Go to universities to teach this. Uh, I like you, man. Yeah, of course. Hey, that, I enjoyed that, man.